morning, everyone. It is uh, great to be here this morning. I've been looking forward to being here with you all today. Uh, cover crops is something that I've been thinking about for many years, and it's exciting to be in Manitoba in a couple of people that want to talk about cover crops. Um, I don't work alone. Uh, I'm happy to play my role as leader of my research group. Um, I rely on collaborations with so many people. And I see some of them, many of them here in the room, including graduate students that are working with me, and farmers and colleagues, or agronomists or researchers. And, uh, and so I just want to acknowledge sort of the community of people that work with me to understand cover crops and cropping systems in Manitoba, as well as the colleagues at the university we've been working with you as a community of people working on organic smartness for a long time. So starting off this conference or workshop, I thought it was important to just talk about where we're at because many people are coming to this meeting in different places. Some of you have a lot of experience working with cover crops. It's integral to what you do. You don't even think about it anymore. It's just part of what you do. Some of you are just starting out. Uh, maybe you've done this for a few years and you're looking for more information about how to do this better, how to make it interleave with your system more uh, seamlessly. And others may be here looking for you know, the basics just starting out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the context for cover crops in Manitoba. Um, in this opening session for this workshop today, regardless of where you are on the spectrum of working with cover crops, I, I, I want to challenge every one of you to think about goals and setting goals for your cover crops. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the options for windows in this presentation. And later on in the agenda, I'll come back and talk with you about some more details. So let's unpack the context of cover crops for now. I think it's important to talk about this. We'll continue this way. So cover crops are, something that I think is really exciting about cover crops is that they move from kind of an isolated space into the conversation for a conventional agriculture. But, um, maybe that doesn't matter so much for this group because you're comfortable working in sort of unconventional spaces, but it's super exciting for me as a researcher because the audience of people that are interested in cover crops is expanding. I hope that's exciting for you and that the window of people that you can talk with and network about cover crops has grown, not only in this province, but across North America. Um, I think cover crops in and of themselves are not a destination, they are a tool for change in your systems, the systems that you're working with. So I think that's a really important part of the paradigm shift. Cover crops themselves are not the destination. It's a tool, just like any other tool that you use on your farm to reach a goal that you have. And so here in Manitoba, I feel like we're in a place where there's lots of interest. We have experienced early adopters, but we still have fairly limited knowledge from the average farmer or from the average agronomist out there. And so, I mean, that's good for me. There's lots of job security there. There's lots of work to do. If I think about my journey with cover crops, um, it really started here when I started reading the literature about cover crops as an MSc student in the early 2000s. How has that become a long time ago? Um, where I moved from Manitoba to Saskatchewan. And the literature I was reading about cover crops at the time was all about fallow replacement. So if we can imagine a time, although it was not that long ago, where fallow was a significant part of cropping systems on the prairies. And the last time that there was a lot of effort and research into cover crops on the prairies is when we were working with systems that had fallow. And so, you know, we had some really forward-thinking scientists at Ag Canada that were even breeding cover crops specifically for this system that didn't use a lot of water, that fixed nitrogen. And, and so I feel like that was sort of one of the last times that we had a big focus on cover crops in the prairie. So I, I picked up that literature and moved on with it. I had the opportunity um, as a student, the or MSc student at the U of S, to do some work in organic systems focused on green manure crops. And I feel like for this audience of people here today, this may be your first connection point with cover crops. If you're in an organic system, green manures, 
um, are, are really important. And we actually have a lot of research on the prairies around this subject and topic of green manures, thanks to people like Martin and others who have been working on organic systems on the prairies. So the goals for green manures are similar to the paradigm that we're talking about, or the new way that we're thinking about, par uh, about cover crops. But things have continued to shift. And I connect this with a big move on my part. Here's me standing in the shadow of the National Ag Library at the USDA in Maryland, where I moved from, Sus from Saskatchewan to Maryland to do research for my PhD on cover crops. And there was still research there going on on greenfowl, or sorry, not greenfowl, not greenfowl, uh, green manures. Here's me in front of a very scary plow where we were incorporating cover crops. But the reason that I was there and the focus of my research went well beyond that. It touched on environmental impacts and how we can use plants as tools for influencing how nutrients move and water moves in our environment. So here's a picture that I took on Steve Groff's farm before tillage radish was a thing. But I was working on radishes as a graduate student at Ray Wilde's lab. And you know, this is a picture of a hilly landscape in Pennsylvania, something that was pretty foreign to me, being from the prairies. And we were interested not only in how water was moving over top of the soil, you know, and the impacts on water quality, but if you can, you can sort of barely see here this set of jars and this demonstration here about the in interaction between cover crops and soil and management and water quality. We were really interested in those bottom jars and what was happening to the quality of water moving through these landscapes and getting to the Chesapeake Bay. So we were really studying cover crops as catch crops to try and keep nutrients um, in place. And this is an important thing for us to be thinking about as we want to enhance nutrient cycling or change nutrient cycling. Coming back home, the context of cover crops and erosion is still really important. But you know, water water is an important force in our landscape. But I think from what I've seen here in our prairie landscape over the last several springs, let's say the last five years, I think cover from wind erosion is an important issue. And many of you and us and neighbors have been experiencing and seeing uh, snow that has soil that has blown off a field. We can talk about why and how. So I think this context for cover crops is really important. Even though we think like it freezes for the winter and everything stays the same and static, but we do to manage our land with cover crops in the fall and the spring is really important for this winter time period for us. Okay, so I successfully got a job after finishing a PhD in the middle of the biggest recession in the US, and I landed in such a wonderful place in North Dakota with NDSU in the middle of North Dakota in Carrington, and it was such an exciting place to be um, in the late 2000s where farmers were already innovating and adapting cover crops into their system, primarily due to grazing. And I feel like this is the part where we're doing really well in Manitoba, that, that um, connection that we have with farmers in North Dakota um, is really strong, especially in this community of people in Manitoba that are innovating with cover crops for grazing, because there is that natural um, and economic link to the value of this plant material with mixed systems. So I've talked about my own story and path of cover crops and, and uh, all the different ways that the focus of cover crops have changed across time, both uh, here in Manitoba and perhaps across North America. Um, one of the themes that I see in this shift in the way we're thinking about cover crops is the focus on intensifying our crop rotations. So just like we were intensifying crop rotations by eliminating this fallow period in the 80s, where we were not growing crops for an entire year. The context for me for cover crops now is we're focusing on those fallow periods outside of our cash crop windows, right? Or thinking about the value of that period rather than just sort of seeing it as the time when my job is done. So really um, transitioning from fallow shoulder seasons in, in annual cropping systems to a goal of having plants living as long as we can. And the reason that's important is we know that those plants 
are what connects the soil to the energy from the sun. And so, and those communities of microorganisms that are dependent on plants to push that energy through their roots out into the, out into the soil. So using plants to capture solar energy to feed carbon. And that can be dynamic carbon that's feeding you know, this soil food web, or it can be trying to increase stable forms of carbon if we think about organic matter and all of the physical um, and structural benefits that we get from having more carbon in our soil. Okay, so that took me a lot longer to talk about than I thought. Um, but I think this is really important for setting the stage today. Um, so extending this green period is a means to an end for us. And so uh, I've been talking to reporters. Uh, there's more interest in cover crops on the prairies, which is super exciting. And one of the places I also wanted to talk about this morning is though I'm a professor and so I'm supposed to define things and tell you what they are. I've been challenged to do that in the context of prairie cropping systems. So what is a cover crop to us here on the prairies? Um, and I think the complexity of defining that one thing relates to all the different names that we do and have used for cover crops in the time because each of these different names that we use for essentially plants as a, as a management tool reflect the multiple purposes that we have for using them. Everything from, you know, manures for feeding the soil, providing nutrients to plants that will grow afterwards, to, um, you know, some other crops for suppressing weeds, to this word that we use here in Manitoba, polycrops, which are annual forage, or at least that's how I interpret the use of that word, polycrops. So if I was to come up with a definition of cover crops, it's not going to be one that you like uh, because it's not, you know, one sentence, here it is, boom. I think we're in a very flexible period where the meaning of cover crops is dynamic. But when I look at how we're using cover crops to try and come up with a definition for cover crops, I see some themes. There are definitely plants that are grown to achieve certain functions. I think a lot of people are focused on soil health, managing problem soils, in some cases, trying to manage pests. One important theme is that they're grown in a time and space where our cash crops are not. All oh, the, the lines for that are becoming blurred, especially as we increase um, our interest and skill set in intercropping, which is something that this group had a meeting last year focused on. So the cover crops may or may not be grown as an intercrop with a cash crop. They may be grown across an entire field or they may be targeted to specific areas of the field. They may be incorporated into the soil or not. If we think about you know, the concept of green fallow or green manure crops, one of the questions I get is, you know, do I have to incorporate this cover crop with tillage? And, and I think that speaks to sort of the dynamic change in what cover crop means to people in Manitoba. And this cover crop may or may not be grazed by livestock. Okay, so I think these are some important themes about what cover crops are. But I want to acknowledge that the lines are really blurry right now. And that is because we're in this period of innovation and I think that's healthy and good. It's hard for policymakers, and it's great that we have um, programs in Manitoba that have cover crops on the agenda. Um, and one of the, the, uh, the programs that are now supported within Manitoba, but I think that there's some complexity there that's really hard to define as I talk about the definition of cover crops. So all these different types of, of, of crops, things that kind of blur in between them. We also have sort of who is using cover crops. I think that's blurry right now too. We have all these different farms, farm types, ways that you identify as your goals. But one of the things that I really want to focus on today in my conversation with you is even if these things are all blurry right now, this should be crystal clear. Knowing what your goal is, even if that goal changes over time, being clear about what your goal is and what you're trying to achieve by using these plants as a tool uh, in your system that you're managing. So talking about goals, We've got both short-term and long-term goals. And you may be somewhere in the spectrum here of needing short-term results and building towards long-term outcomes. 
So we have many different types of goals that you might be setting for this cover crop. And you may just have one thing that you want to focus on, like I want to prevent that soil erosion that I saw in the picture, you know, from the snert in the field. Or maybe I have a set of goals, and you may need to prioritize those goals that you have. So let's unpack some of these goals. I think nitrogen fixation and nutrient cycling is an important goal that's probably common to almost everyone. And how you're going to do that, or what type of nutrient you're going to focus on, if it's nitrogen that you want to fix from the atmosphere versus nitrogen that you want to recapture from the soil profile, is important to think about. I think a lot of people will have a common goal of wanting to build carbon in their soil. And I talked about those two different types of carbons. We have dynamic carbon that's being cycled by microbes, it's readily available. And then we have sort of the structural carbon that's more recalcitrant, that helps build the soil aggregates, increases infiltration, creates macrophores, things like that in the soil. <coughs> we also may have some important goals relating to either water or wind erosion. And we need to think about how we're going to achieve that when <coughs> those periods of erosion happen. Where do they happen? It may not be throughout your entire field that are important to target, especially thinking about water erosion. Wind erosion, it may not be every crop that needs, that where you need that residue. And here's a picture of a soybean field where we have very little residue after harvest. But we have other, like maybe you're not a soybean grower, maybe you grow peas. We have lots of crops that have very little residue and we can balance that with crops that have high residue. If you don't have a lot of crops with a lot of residue that persists in your system, I think it's important to be thinking about how cover crops can create that residue that you need to protect your soil. Then we have certain areas or problem areas, right? You may have a goal that you have an area of your field that looks like this, that's really wet. Maybe you have an entire field that's been very wet this past harvest season. And then how we can use cover crops to bring these areas of the field back into production. Maybe your problem isn't just water, but it's what comes with water, and it's salinity, right? And so uh, it's very hard to establish plants, even as cover crops for perennial crops in these areas. And so we've got to focus on these areas over here that are not salty yet to try and use the water. And, you know, perennials are the way to go, but maybe you need a stepping stone to get there. Maybe you need to transition. And you know, a strategy like this of growing uh, cover crops in the areas where, for example, this corn crop didn't establish, it's right next to the slough, we know that there are salts moving, is an important goal for you, and it's very site-specific. Maybe you have a goal to reduce tillage, and I think this is important in organic systems, and I think cover crops are this ingredient that are going to help us reach goals for reduced tillage. Whether your goal is to go entirely no-till or to just take steps to reduce tillage, I think cover crops have an important role to enable you to do that in your system. Another really important goal for cover crops is, or that's very popular right now with cover crops, is alleviating soil compaction. And this is something that I was able to um, learn from my peers who were studying how cover crops can alleviate soil compaction in Maryland when we were looking at this tillage radish, how it creates root channels. So here's our radish root. After that root dies, it decomposes. There's then sort of this highway that other roots can follow. And so we see a picture here of the soybean root following that radish root through a root restricting layer in the soil profile. Um, I'm running out of time, so maybe I'll talk a little bit more about how this actually happens and how we can use cover crops to target this objective when I speak to you later today. And lastly, maybe your goal is the, how these things fit together, utilizing livestock um, to make um, cover crops benefit the livestock and benefit your soil. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of goals I'm running out of time. So we may also have goals that extend beyond uh, large livestock. Maybe we're thinking about the small ones and insects and how we can integrate that goal into how we plan cover crops. Mm -hmm. So we, um, 
So we have some fundamentals for getting started. If you once you have your goal in mind, which is probably the most important thing about being clear about maybe you have different goals for different fields, maybe your goals are shifting over time. Once you have that, we'll talk about finding windows. Um, and then I think Lee is really going to talk next about management. And then later on today, I'll be talking about different tools that you have in the toolbox and different types of plants that you can be using to address these range um, of different goals. So I'm going to skip through some of, well, no, here, I'll spend a few minutes. So, we, so it's important to have your goal. It's important to then take a look across your rotation and figure out what your best uh, windows are. And so where you're planning to do grazing of annual crops is probably the window where you're going to be able to um, grow the most biomass because you're willing to allocate the time and space to it to grow that forage. We also have these uh, after harvest windows and we have sort of a range of crops that are um, harvested early and those I think are an important part to focus on. And maybe those don't happen on large acres or every year in your, in your system but we can prioritize those crops if they bring this other value into your system. Um, I think we're challenged because in Manitoba we're growing longer and longer growing season crops, but I would say that challenge is not unique to us, although we, we do technically have shorter growing seasons than many other places where they're growing cover crops. Everywhere I've done research on cover crops, their farmers are optimizing that growing season, right? So everyone has just a short period, and our challenge is to figure out how to integrate cover crops into those short um, periods, just like everyone else. Obviously, any, kind of, any place where you have forages or silage harvest in your rotation is a place where you're creating this dramatic change in removing biomass. And that period of dramatic change is also, I think, one of our best windows um, for integrating cover crops into our system. But if not everyone is, is doing this. I think if we think, if uh, thinking about not just an entire field, but areas within your field, this is one of our best windows. Finding those wet areas, or finding those salty areas is, other, is another great place to get started um, with cover crops and a much needed window that we have in our systems. I also want to start talking about how we can create some space for cover crops. So. Um, row crops, where we physically have more space in between the plants, uh, is an important place to be thinking about how we can integrate cover crops. So I'd say this is like the next level. Um, or if you are working with narrow row spacing crops, many of the topics that you talked about in last year's workshop on intercropping are also skill sets that I think are going to be really helpful, even if you're working on narrow row spacing, thinking about how you relay crop and create this diversity. Okay, so I made it, and I'm still under time. It wasn't looking very promising there for a few minutes. But, made it to the summary. We definitely have a new paradigm for cover crops in Manitoba. And we are still focused on intensifying our systems, but the periods or the places where we're working on that intensification definitely has shifted. And we have many different goals for cover crops. I'm sure if you talk around your tables today, the, the way that you see using this tool in your system is very diverse. And so that may make it hard. You want, you want someone to come and say like, this is how you should do it right. This is how it's gonna be repeatable every time success. Um, but I think one of the most important keys to having your success is knowing which goal or goals are most important to you and prioritizing those and finding the best windows to achieve those goals in your rotation is the next most important step. And I'm really looking forward to Lee's talk next, to talk about some of the more advanced steps um, that he's been working with with farmers in North Dakota in terms of figuring out the agronomy for, uh, for cover crops, because that's really 